This is part of a uh, short pamphlet I did some time ago, years ago in fact, about Spurgeon. Just some of the points. I've just come across this actually. Uh, right, let's start. Spurgeon Chancer jumps onto another popular bandwagon. This is what our fundamentalist Calvinist has to say concerning Popish Free Will and Universal Salvation Heretic D.L. Moody. It has given us much pleasure to assist our brethren, Messrs. Moody and Sneaky, Sankey, that it should be, at Camberwell Hall, and we would have done far more, only our enterprises demand our constant attention. Our heart is very warm towards them for their work's sake. The fuss made about their preaching at Eton is a sad sign of the condition of Escapalians amongst no other sect of Christians would respectable persons have been found to oppose the useful labours of our American friends? All other Protestants would have welcomed them. Sword and Trowel, July 1875. Nice to hear fundamentalists supporting the doctrines of grace, even of Tulip. <laughs> this is Spurgeon for you. He was attacked for siding with heretics, such as D.L. Moody. Uh, further promotion of self to a popular movement of the day. It has been the editor's great joy to take part on two occasions in Mr Moody's work in Croydon. On Friday, May 16th, all students went over. All the students went over to Croydon and formed part of the enormous multitude who gathered to hear a sermon from their president. We are more and more impressed with the sense of the remarkable power which rests upon the beloved Moody. <laughs> His words are plain and fresh. <laughs> oh dear, from the heart. And a special arrangement far on high goes there with both to saint and sinner. It is a happy thing for London that such a shower of blessing is falling on it. Sword and Trial, June 1884. Uh, that's like that's like Judas standing in the pulpit and saying, "Bless you, bless you." You watch Bishop of Canterbury or something, or, or the Pope standing in a big pulpit, eh? The Antichrist in a pulpit and Spurgeon going, "Ah, well done. Oh, give him applause." I mean, the man. Moody was a closet papist. He, he, he declared himself to be a closet papist. He declared himself to be a nominal Christian. He declared himself to be a bumbling idiot. He declared himself to be non-doctrinal. He declared himself to be a universal salvationist, which is heresy. He declared himself to be everything that God did not want in a person. And yet... Spurgeon and Moody and the rest. So no, God blessed him. <laughs> How perverse can you, the enemy get? And it is the enemy promoting neo-evangelicalism. Neo-evangelicalism. Okay. Before Moody spoke at the Croydon Convention, Spurgeon stood up to prepare prime the congregation by hyping up the closet papers D.L. Moody. Hmm? I want you to know to hear me a moment while I say that the brother who is now about to speak, Mr. Moody, is one whom we all love. <laughs> he is not only one whom all we all love, but he is evidently one whom God loves. We feel devoutly grateful to Almighty God for raising him up and for sending him to England to preach the gospel to such great numbers with such plainness and power. <laughs> we shall continue to pray for him when he has gone home. Among the things we shall pray for will be that he may come back again. Mr. Spurgeon's Jubilee, 18, 1884. Spurgeon more Arminian credentials. He was an Arminian. He was totally Arminian. In a letter addressed to Ben Nicholson, printed in The Sword and the Trowel, April 1882, Spurgeon declares that when Moody and Sankey entered London in that, very, sorry, in that same year, much opposition was forthcoming. 
which hindered souls being saved. <laughs> this man is called a fundamentalist. Can't you pick and believe it? Hey, eh? hindered souls being saved. So, what God is he serving? Huh? Impotent God. Oh, you know, with these neo-evangelicals, their attitude is, and their heart is bent to, God being impotent. Oh, here he is. Here he is. Here's God. He is. Shake the hand with God. Hello, hello. I made my commitment. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. This is the puny God they serve. God can't do anything. He's biting his nails. Oh, oh, I can't save them because, the, oh, I'm being hindered. Oh, oh, well, who's, who's upholding nature then? The natural world? Who is upholding the spiritual world? Who's upholding all the stars? Everything, all creation. If God is biting his chin to fingernails and can't save us all. Oh. Eh? No wonder man says, oh, we're in charge. Friends of the earth. We can save the earth. Oh no, we're going to destroy the earth. <laughs> we're petrol chemical plants and spraying in the air and all the rest of it. Chemicals. Eh? It's pathetic. These people are pathetic. Spurgeon is pathetic. Moody's pathetic. The people that follow him and adore them and worship them and idolatrise them. Idolise them, rather. They're pathetic. These are a laughing stock of hell. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. None can resist the invincible ruler, upholder of all things. These godless wretches present a god of their own imagination, their own evil imagination. And we Christians can turn around and say to wicked men, you're going to hell. I've done it. So should others do it. And I'm sure others do it. You're going to hell. And what Spurgeon did and his, his, his buddy boys was to take away the authoritative side amongst everything else of Christianity. For us to be able to go with conviction and to say to a reprobate and see them as a reprobate and say you're going to hell. You're going to hell. Master to a Muslim. Looked him straight in the face. I said, you're going to hell. It is clear that God has reprobated you and that you will end up in hell. And he turned away. Because he knew where he was going. You could see it in his eyes. We are fixed in eternity as to our standing or our falling. And we can do nothing about it. This bastard here about chastisement <sighs> said his God was hindered. Carry on. The movement in London had comparatively no link with churches and fostered a rival spirit and hence it did not bring a permanent blessing of increase of the churches. You see, God was thwarted. This statement was made by one who claimed to be a Calvinist, strict Baptist. Can we not see how Spurgeon did not mind what denomination was involved in the Charles Gunderson Finney revivalist movement of anti-reformation doctrine and how we have the same today? That doctrine does not matter. Only having persons sign commitment cards, so Spurgeon, the Calvinist, would have it. Being of an Armenian universal salvation spirit, 
1 John 4 and 1, that is test the spirits to see if they be of God, that's what John 4 1 is. Charles Haddon Spurgeon lied, continually lied in professing election to salvation and election to reprobation, which he always confirms in his non-doctrinal sermons of free will. Now in a sermon entitled Little Sins, preached at Music Hall, Surrey Gardens, 17th of April, 18. 59, Spurgeon has this to say against election. If there were a good man in a prison today and you did not go to see him, would you think that a great, that a great sin? Certainly not. You say, I would not think of doing such a thing. If you saw a man hungry and you did not feed him, would you think that a great sin? No, you say, I would not. Nevertheless, these are the very things for which men are sent to hell. Hmm? What said the judge? I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. Thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was sick in prison, and you visited me not. For as much as you have done this, unto the least of these, my brethren, you have not done it unto me. Just before I start on this, Spurgeon never did any of that. He never visited prisons. <laughs> went to the pool. Anyhow, Spurgeon leaves out all the fact that Christ separated the sheep from the goats. He did. Before he actually said this. That sheep existed. Did not come, I should read, into being through any works of theirs. Because yeah. there were sheep and there were goats before, again, these words were spoken. But existed with sheep before any works done, saved without works. Whilst those who adhered to works for salvation, which is contained in here, that Spurgeon said they should have done and then they could have got saved, who adhered to works for salvation, the goats, hypocrites in revealed religion, existed. There were goats before and after their works, which all represent two sides of the same coin. Spurgeon translates, sorry, also translates the passage to refer to the day of judgment, which is something from a man so instructed of God, the Holy Ghost. Now then, go down a bit. So favoured of heaven, okay? Spurgeon translates a passage to the end of time, and whilst doing so, defones Jesus Christ, which the passage does not do. Spurgeon here called calling Christ the judge instead of king. Verse 34, because he was king in this passage. As it was Christ as king who divided one set of souls from the other. But Spurgeon cannot allow Christ to rule because the days were fast going away from recognising the reign of Jesus Christ over creation. The spirit of the age going more and more over to man ruling the world. The Thomas Paine attitude that God Almighty just sits back and waits for time to run out. Spurgeon also overlooks the context together as he is addressing the world when he should be addressing his own kind who profess to serve God. The world does not profess to serve the great king. Only hypocrites do. Okay? Since when did we last find an atheist, so-called, trying to please God? Equally, we find that the day of judgment is spoken of as future in 45 and 46, yeah. Of Matthew 25. Well, all right. When Jesus Christ came in the glory of his finished work, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And one of the many tasks handed to him as the great king was to divide, which the work of redemption does, the children of God from the apostates in religion. And this illustrates two sides of election that some hypocrites like Spurgeon profess to own. Then they speak like the hypocrites. They are in disowning it when speaking in sermons and books. Let's go for the last one. Spurgeon on the Quaker. Spurgeon asked 
was asked to speak at a Quaker memorial upon the founder of the Quakers, George Fox. So at Devonshire House on the 6th of November 1866, Spurgeon spoke upon the life and work of George Fox. Spurgeon has this to say of the event. With every great thankfulness, very great thankfulness, but bowed down under responsibility, mm, we found ourselves in the midst of a most cordial company of about 1,200 friends in their meeting house at Bishop Gate Street. The great kindness of the brethren who met us made us feel at home at once. <laughs> Can you imagine this? Uh, he's promoting Quakerism as Christianity. <laughs> and although suffering much physical pain, it was one of the happiest seasons of my life when we stood up in the crowded assembly to speak for Jesus to those who love his name. Oh, God. This is the enemy. Quakerism is the enemy. Our object was not to to moot points of difference, <laughs> but to stimulate brethren to strive for their precious things wherein we agree. So you left them in their sins, did you, Mr. Arminian? You didn't preach the gospel to them, of law, because eh? it begins with law, and the gospel. Oh no, no, they, they were Christians, but we had little differences, you see. <laughs> okay, we did not feel that we had any right to con controvert, nor indeed does our spirit move in that direction. He's a frigging coward, you know. You were a coward. He didn't know what he stood for. <laughs> so he couldn't. They'd have hammered him into the ground. Hey, love, we've just got C.H. Spurgeon into the picking ground. He's a waste of space, and he doesn't know what he picking believes. He's supposed to be a Calvinist. Now he's Arminian, now he's gone Calvinist, now he's Arminian, now he's Quaker. <laughs> now he's neo evangelical. <clears> hmm? <throat> hey? Now he's a Darwin. <laughs> Anyhow, our object was not to mute points of difference, but to stimulate brethren to strive for those precious things wherein we agree. We did not feel that we had any right to controvert, nor indeed does our spirit move in that direction. We felt full of love. Mm -hmm to the Lord's living people. They were freaking condemned. They're still condemned under darkness. And desired in tenderness and humbleness of mind to exhort them to more fervour and boldness. Oh, that the Holy Ghost may seal our testimony. It was delivered with great solemnity of soul and was attended with many cries to God. Surely it will not be in vain. And on, and go up a bit. We only wanted one thing more, viz, the permission to have poured out our soul in prayer upon the spot. But our, oh, how flowery is this piggin' lot? But as our esteemed friend, Mr Gilpin, seemed to indicate that silence would be preferable. Hum, bring Jesus out. Hum, he's in the soul. Hum, he's in the inner light. Hum. <laughs> Can you imagine him sitting there going, hum, hum. <laughs> this fella is a cracker, you know. He's, he's light as a fairy, he really is. And light as a feather. In his flowery sermons and flowery writings. However, there is a much heart... <laughs> Heartbreak, neo evangelicalism again in the assembly. Heartbreak! Oh, 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 the flowers are lifting up off the table, dear. Oh, just keep going. Oh. <laughs> we, are, <laughs> we have been favoured by a copy of remarks sent to the Friend newspaper from one of the most eminent ministers among the Friends, whose name is dear to us all who know. His labours, our friend Jonathan Grupp. <laughs> and we print his remarks in the sword and trowel because we think they will gratify our readers and perhaps lead them to bear the friends upon their own, sorry, on their hearts in prayer.
from the Sword and Trial, December 1866. So basically, Spurgeon was promoting another evil, Quakerism, <coughs> hmm? to his friends, just as he, well, I say friends, just his congregation, okay? As he did his students to D.L. Moody, the heretic. <laughs> he just didn't want to go the right way, did he, this fella? He couldn't go the right way. He was on the broad road of, of, of profession, that's all. Hey, nice to hear that the fundamentalist, Darwinian, Arminian, Socinian, Spurgeon kept up his end in declaring that salvation is not restricted to any denomination and doctrine, but simply a matter of making a decision, and so one may make that decision in the Church of Rome and partake of the Mass, just like Ian Paisley did, at the end, when coming out of the closet. Hey. Spurgeon, Christians be found in the Church of Rome. Spurgeon, the fundamentalist, does not hold that Romanism is Antichrist. And he didn't. He didn't. No. And that because of this we may find Christians worshipping in this establishment. Nice to hear this, see the fundamentalist being upheld by Spurgeon. <laughs> As being one with the likes of Luther and Calvin. Spurgeon has this to say to back up his claims of Christians swinging them on nonsense in the dark institution. Now you see, Calvin and the rest rightly claim that the Church of Rome was Antichrist. Rightly they did so. Spurgeon doesn't. And yet he said he, he was of the Reformed faith. <laughs> Lying brat. In Brussels, I heard a good sermon in a Romish church. What's he doing in there in the first place? The darkness attracted to darkness, no doubt. Now then, in a Roman church, Romish church, the place was crowded with people, many of them started.